Good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Davies. I'm from University of Canterbury in New Zealand. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you at the World Con Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction. I want to talk to you about the meanings of words because I believe that if we are to make any progress in genuine disaster risk reduction, we do that by talking to each other, by communicating with each other. And what do we use when we communicate with each other? We use words. I want to give you something to think about in the context of the word risk. I'm very happy with what disasters are. I'm very happy with the con concept of reducing disasters I have severe reservations about the use of the word risk. But let's go back to basics. Here are some UN definitions. A disaster is a serious disruption of the functioning of a community. It's something big. It affects a local area. Disaster risk, again, occurs to a particular community and, importantly, over a specified future time period, not forever. Risk has to do with the probability of an event. And finally, what disaster risk reduction means. Reducing disaster risk through systematic attempts to analyze and manage the causal effect of disasters. Think about the relevant future time period here. It's not forever. It's more than the lifetime of a person or a family, but not very much longer. It's of the order of 100 years or so, I suggest. So we're trying to reduce disasters in a local community over quite a short time period. The implication of these definitions is that probabilistic risk information can be useful in reducing the disasters that will affect communities in the time scale that's relevant to them. I wish to point out that this implication is not true, which casts serious doubt on the meaning of the word risk and suggests that when we use the word risk, we are very, very conscious of what it might mean to other people. How many disasters will a particular community experience in a time period relevant to it? Well. By definition, because disasters are serious events, if serious events are happening every 10 years to a community, the community will have done something about it already. So by definition, the number of disasters a community will experience in the future is small. And this is where the problem comes in with using statistics. If we're trying to predict what will happen statistically or probabilistically in a small sample of events, we will probably be wrong. If you toss a coin once, you have a 50-50 chance it will come down heads or tails. You never get half of a head or half of a tail. Statistics don't work for small populations. Therefore, probabilistic predictions of future disasters are intrinsically unreliable for particular communities. Therefore, we should not be using them to devise disaster reduction strategies. At much larger scales of numbers of events in much larger samples, such as the, um, the number of communities a government is responsible for, or when an insurance company is spreading disaster risk around the planet, certainly probabilistic predictions are useful, but not for a specific community. In the mind of any given community, the most important disaster is the next one. And that cannot be predicted probabilistically. Even with national and global disaster reduction strategies, I would suggest that these will not succeed unless local disasters are being effectively dealt with. You can't have a global strategy and still have lots and lots of local disasters going on. It's a nonsense. This is an enormous problem. And it appears to go to the heart of what we're all talking about here at Sendai. And I believe this problem arises from misplaced use of the word risk in a lot of the, 
a lot of the statements that are made and a lot of the rhetoric that goes around. And in fact, listening to much, much of the discussion this week, I've found that if you take the word risk out of almost everything, it makes no difference at all to the sense of what is being said. I'm not suggesting that that's going to happen in the very near future, but I am suggesting it might be something worth, worth thinking about. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening. I'd be very happy to <laughs> indulge in some discussion if that's what you wish. Thank you. Hi, uh, Joanna for Walker, UCL. If for local communities you don't want to use a probabilistic risk-based metric, what do you propose we do use? Thank you for that question. I think with a local community, they want to know what can happen to them rather than being given probabilities. I was in Christchurch during the 2011 earthquake sequence. That took us all by surprise. It was unexpected. It shouldn't have been because it was in the range of probabilities that everyone knew about, but its probability of occurrence was about one in 10,000. So it made no sense to try to um, prepare for it. There are many more urgent things to prepare for. You never know what the next disaster is going to be. The idea that I'm pursuing is that a community itself must be responsible or must be allowed to be responsible for its preparation for the next disaster. It requires information about the sort of disasters that can occur, so it needs advice from scientists. It also needs to link with the larger nation and district and community, so it needs advice from local government offices. My suggestion is that every community forms a resilience research team where the community and the scientists and the officers sit around a table, pull all the information they have, and develop a scenario for what can happen next. Now, this isn't a scenario such as a hurricane or an earthquake or an asteroid impact. It's not an event scenario, it's an effects scenario. The effects of all these different types of disasters are in fact quite similar. Loss of infrastructure, Loss of income, loss of commerce, loss of life, loss of communications. So if a scenario can be developed by the community with expert advice, that community can then start to think about how it can be less vulnerable to those effects whenever they happen in the future. So I call this community-based resilience research. It's been done a few times in a few isolated places around the world. Um, we're starting some of these exercises in New Zealand, and I think it has a great deal of promise to sit alongside risk-based disaster reduction procedures which operate at, at larger scales. Does that make any sense to you? Thank you. Microphone man. Um, I was a little bit interested in the fact that you said that disasters happen so infrequently at a community level. But if you're, that is if you're looking at the big disasters, like the tsunamis yes. and the earthquakes and the whatever. Yep. But uh, most communities in the parts of the world that I, well, in the part of the world that I live in, are faced with much more frequent disasters, which also have very debilitating effects. Oh, yeah. uh, so I have a question about that. And then the scenario you just mapped out, um, sounds very, very positive, and I, li I, see, I like it. But I'm not sure all poor communities, especially in, in South Asia and places, are able to actually have that kind of uh, independence because they are, their lives and their livelihoods and what they do is very severely impacted by the external environment. Yes. Thank you very much. Those are very good questions. In response to the first one, if the disasters are occurring sufficiently frequently, you can treat them probabilistically. But you need to have of the order of five or ten of these happening in a lifetime in order for the probabilities to be matched by what actually occurs in reality. 
in terms of the ability of a community to engage in the sort of dialogue that I've mentioned, obviously this will vary from community to community, but I know some of my colleagues have been doing this sort of work in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, with small local communities, and I've not been involved, but the feedback has been very encouraging. Obviously, I'm, it's a council of perfection, but at least it gives us a definite goal to aim at, which isn't all messed up with probabilities and stuff. Thank you. No, just what uh, she mentioned, I think it's working. It's no. see, it sounds very good, but it seems a very um, idealistic situation in which community, if you just give them the information, they're able to do everything. I think whatever they are living over there, like in my country, every from the last five years, we have the flood. It's a regular phenomena for them. They don't even get the chance to recover from the recovery. Yes. And then it's becoming a chronic vulnerability. Yep. Sort of. yep. So. The, now the, we have two options, whether we just give them the information and they let them, okay, decide you do whatever that. I think now we know the situation is not like that simple. This means they are surviving, they are resilient enough, but now they need extra help. Absolutely. And where the roles of different stakeholders comes. I wish that could happen the way you are suggesting, <laughs> but that seems a bit... bit a bit too optimistic, yeah. Um, if your situation is as chronic as you say, that it is not the sort of rare disaster that I'm talking about. It is obviously a very serious and stressful situation and it needs to be addressed, but I think it's not the topic that I'm talking about. The other point I would, I would say in response to you and the previous questioner is that this whole process of community scientist official interaction needs very expert facilitation. It needs unbiased facilitation. It needs empathetic facilitation and it may fail, but I believe it has the potential to succeed and is therefore at least worth raising at this, at this forum. Thank you. I see your point of, uh, let's say, the loose use of the word risk in a lot of uh, discussions and also the problems, of course, with uh, probabilistics uh, trying to um, to predict, let's say, certain very uh, infrequent uh, events. However, let's say, if you do a community-based uh, approach uh, and coming up with all kinds of uh, interventions that you think are, uh, are useful to prepare yourself for, uh, for disasters, at some point you need to make uh, decisions uh, because you can't do it all. Uh, mo money is finite, the amount of money. And then I think the, if you use it correctly, I think uh, risk can be an, uh, a, a good way of, uh, let's say, uh, prioritizing uh, what measures are, uh, let's say, uh, uh, effective and, and which are not. Uh, for instance, if you look to flooding situations, you can do uh, invest in prevention, like uh, building levees or dikes, you can invest in evacuation, you can invest in uh, zoning or planning. And depending on the local situation, uh, each of these can be effective. So what I'm arguing about is that I think risk can still be, let's say, a useful uh, uh, um, uh, concept uh, for, in the end, uh, decision making, because that's, that's what needs to be done at the end. I agree completely. I'm not suggesting that the word risk be banned. I'm simply suggesting that the concept be given its appropriate prominence in, in the rhetoric. And I believe it is given such prominence that it becomes predominant. Um, to me, risk analysis is one tool. Sometimes it's valuable. Honestly, sometimes it is not. And that's all that I humbly ask that you think about. Thank you.